Speak, a platform for artisans to talk candidly about their career in the arts and also to weigh in with their opinion on some of the creative industry's biggest issues. My name is Jennifer DeMarco. I'm a novelist, poet, playwright, filmmaker, core mechanic designer for games, and a musician. And today I am speaking with Gregor Fieljev. Fialja, Fial, Fial, no, okay, wait, no, Gregor, Gregor, now come on, come on, this is episode you know, five I, it, of It's speak. not as bad as when my mother first tried. No, wait, so let me try again. Fialrev. Yes, there you go. Yes, oh, all right, yeah, thank you for your patience. It's not as bad here. as the first time my mother tried to say it. What, will you share what she did? What was her try? Could you remember? It was a much harder yuh sound, like Fialrev. Oh, oh, oh my gosh, okay, so and it was like, like a whole well, another beat in there. Yeah. Uh, but Gregor is the author of the Universal Defender series, among others. Thank you for joining us on Speak, Gregor. So, what should readers know before they jump in? What should they know about you? What should they know about Universal Defender? If you could only say one thing to folks about that they're about to dive into your worlds, what would it be? Like kind of Universal Defender 101, Gregor 101. Um, I'm very much writing for, you know, the kinds of stuff I would have liked to read in my youth. So these are characters who are very rational, reasonable, honorable, and they are putting forth all of their skill to achieve their goals. Mm -hmm. So there, there's not, so I, I swore an oath not to allow plot armor any sway in my books. And that's where this and that, that's going, and that is reflected in my works here, as well as any other works that I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to allow plot armor. Okay, so, and describe that for folks that don't know what you mean, plot armor. So basically, the villain, the villain escapes because the story demands it, right? Or, gotcha. you know, the person survives because the story says they must, right? Yeah. Where, where a, an instance can occur where uh, the rules possibly of the work, of the universe, of something, are bent to achieve a particular outcome. So okay. like gotcha. saying like for like a sudden bout of incompetence that is uncharacteristic of a character that allows some bad thing to happen because you know gen you know because it has now artificially gener generated more conflict and extended uh, the amount of time it takes to solve it. So Okay. So an avoidance of not only plot filler but an avoidance of like the expected tropes thereof. Right. Okay. And it's not even necessarily avoidance of a of expected tropes because mm -hmm. tropes do exist for a reason so, yeah. and that reason is sometimes they work this is just the bad tropes aren't going to be ha happening here you're not going to see some character you know fumbling over their own legs as they try to pursue a bad guy because you know i want because i wanted this one to become a recurring villain or something yeah and this does end up with some characters you know uh, some enemies who would otherwise become recurring villains die mm -hmm. um in universal defender because these characters are like if I let that guy go, mm -hmm. he's going to become a recurring villain. Mm -hmm. And then they stop that from happening because these are characters that will put forth all of their skill to achieve their goals. And it would be unrealistic if the villain then got away. Yes. Okay, gotcha. Um, but, if it is, but if it does become realistic that the villain gets away, then the villain does get away. Yeah. Right? The, everyone is just... Everyone's really gunning for themselves here. Mm -hmm. And it's also pretty hard sci-fi. So, but not, okay. not... But it's like... Well, it's not quite Dune levels of hard sci-fi where you're, or uh, even 41st Millennium type, but it's sci-fi mm -hmm. with sort of, I wouldn't say extra decency, but more like the the expected, the difficulties that you might expect mm -hmm. might not take place because people have already figured it out. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, such as when, such as in a universe like Warhammer 40,000, you have... Use of psychic powers is absolutely damning on the user. Yeah. Because, you know, psychic awakening is just you know, all kinds of absolute hell. But, you know, the use of psionic powers by these characters, it's just like, you know, it's like lifting weights or exercising, mm -hmm. you know, because they've had all this time to figure it out. Yeah. Um, so it's sort of like, I avoid the grim gray. Because I, I feel there's a difference between Grim Dark and Grim Gray. Grim Dark okay. says, bring all the guns and we might survive. Grim Gray says, they brought all the guns, but they did not survive. Mm. Um, and Grim Dark even itself is often ironic um, because, it's so because it's so ridiculously dark and all that. But we avoid the pretentious version of 
they brought all the guns, but they didn't. Now, circle back to me. When you say hard sci-fi, now some folks, they're going to hear hard sci-fi, and that means heavy on the science. Now, by hard sci-fi, right. you mean this more is actually alien more worlds. Alien worlds, exploration yeah. thereof, and, cool. you know, it's, it is, so, like, it's, it is the more kind of, like, it is the more kind of Doctor Who-ish sci-fi than it is okay. the Star Trek sci-fi. Okay. Right. If that right. makes I sense. like that, yeah. Yeah, sure. So, there's, so there's it's not more... hard sci-fi as in um, uh, people should expect CRISPR and yeah. uh, genetic engineering. It's the hard sci-fi, almost like classic sci-fi. It's alien worlds, epic adventure, uh, moral questions, uh, incredibly unscrupulous and complex characters. If not unscrupulous, very complex characters. Right. Okay. Whereas I see Star Trek as characters painted in very broad strokes. Um but I, I more also surface have, adventures. But you know, one thing that always I did like, at least about especially next generation, because generation, because mm-hmm. my, I did prefer next generation over TOS. Mm-hmm. So, um, but what I really liked was always the fact that that these character that those characters too. There was very few frustrating plots in mm-hmm. okay. TNG. I felt like there were very few sort of sort of like oh my god, why haven't they figured this out? Like or like second order idiot plots, right? Where the plot yes. is only happening because characters are idiots. These, a lot, I did take a lot of inspiration from the fact that a lot of characters in Next Generation are themselves putting mm-hmm. forth all their skill to achieve their goals. Yeah. And okay. that they, and they're, they're really trying to figure this out here. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. that's, that is something that, I've, that I do admire in a lot of its writing, and that there's very few um, frustrating plots. Granted, there were some. Mm-hmm. Um, See, in terms of Star Trek, I'm, and, and again, because now we're, now we're going down, we're right. going down the science fiction rabbit hole, um, I, I'm one of those bizarre people that, though I am familiar with all of the various Star Trek uh, franchises, the only one that spoke to me, and I think you would probably guess this from knowing my own work, is Deep Space Nine because of the Bajoran connection right. with the occupation and religion and the way that all came to be, that uh, the topics of oppression and religious fervor always spoke to me. But I love the fact that you're saying next generation, it's almost like let's lift it up out of B grade sci fi and see what we can do with the Star Trek universe. That's I, what like, I saw next what gen it, is. My my opinion on on TNG and DS9 yeah. is that I did like the writing mm-hmm. of TNG much better, but I actually did like the characters of DS9 more. Oh. Uh the mm-hmm. character that I was always really relating to and really being like, oh my goodness, yes, this was always Odo. Oh yeah. Like I've always been Odo in yeah. fact over data? Uh, over data, yes. I hear people compare them all the time, and I'm like, oh, I don't see that. No, no, yeah. Now we're Star Trek uh, fan. I've literally, fan did, like, I, I, I mean, I've, I've even had people sometimes call my demeanor Vulcan. Really? Like, people have even done that before. Um, but then once I started watching DS9 and I saw Odo, and I'm like, oh, yeah, this guy. This yeah. guy, absolutely. Yeah. Everything this man says. So with Universal Defender, you have books one and two out right now. Mm-hmm. And uh, let me just... Actually, let's stay with Universal Defender for a minute, then I'll jump to the others. Now, you have a third book in Universal Defender, a third novel already complete. Yes. And what's the title of that one? That one is Enter Unmaker. Okay. And you also have a pocket size like this one, the uh, Angels of Anarchy Reticent. You have a little blue flash edition, but it's in the Universal Defender universe. Yes. And you see them in like a chronological, there's a timeline. Yeah, I'm trying to, I want to release them in their chronological timeline. Yeah, I like that. And there's currently two that need to have, there's two novellas um, between Fire to Burn the Stars and Enter Unmaker. Both oh, are okay. complete. So it's like book one, book two, book 2.5, book 2.75, and then book three. Well, it's more like book one, book two, mini sewed one, mini sewed two, gotcha. and then book okay. three. Because these gotcha. are like little self contained almost like episodes. And if this is classic sci-fi in, in the definition that we had just said, you also have another blue flash that's completely not related to Universal Defender called In Combat with Time. Yes. And what would you call that? Is it sci-fi? Is it fantasy? That one's high is it fantasy. mystery? High fantasy. Yes, okay. That one is high fantasy. So and it is eclectic. Great. You are an eclectic creator. Sure, why not? <laughs> oh, you know, if that's the word that works, then that's the word that works. Well, and you're also a musician, which mm-hmm. we should definitely just have you back just to talk about. But you are a musician, and let's see, what are what are the other divisions? Uh, you game. You are yes. a gamer. Do you design games? I am one who plays games. I 
Yes and no. Mm -hmm. I do not possess any game design software, mm -hmm. though I have, you know, very detailed documents dis about, you know, what, about games that I would like to design, and like, yeah. uh, like, basically almost everything's planned out, there are core gameplay loops there, mm -hmm. um, you know, their overall story, their, yeah. their individual, their unique mechanics, yeah. um, they're all planned out, there's like three of them. Have you ever written campaigns, like for classic RPG, tabletop gaming? Yes, D and D. Yeah, I've done. I, 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 I try, I try yes. not to limit it just to D and D. I got shot down. I also did. I, well, I also, in, in all fairness, I also do DM uh, Iron Kingdoms and Rogue Trader. Okay, there we go. So, um, and I, I've always been a big fan, actually, of how Iron Kingdoms does its combat. Mm -hmm. That that I think was actually really neat. And but I've also, worked with you as an actor, so I know you do uh, film as well. You've also written film. You've directed film. You've made your own. Oh, right, yeah, those. Yeah, shorts, yeah, and I mean, literally yeah. played each of the characters. What was the name of the one where, remind me, you you literally played three different characters. Well, there's multiple of them. Multiple of those. Oh, okay. So there's a whole series of what is me playing different characters, which is just me in different shirts. Right, yeah. Um, and it's a continuous series, and there, there's one more that, I still, that I'm still working on. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the, the big overall epic conclusion to it. Mm -hmm. That's um, cool. But they were all like sort of comedy skits of me in different shirts. Um, that, and that but the, the conversations point. flow, and that's, I mean, yes, you're right. Very, you know, we're not talking about special effects right. and, you know, elaborate No, because I, I can't, because, I mean, like, I don't have that sort of software. Sure. Like, I'm just, and I'm, do, I'm doing, like, practical tricks and, you know, camera foolery and yeah. perspective cheating. And, like, and this is how you know, like, split frames and different timings. Like, there's mm -hmm. one scene in one of these shorts where where a character is is talking off camera and then a glass bottle gets shot by a BB gun, right, and goes poof, yeah, right, right next to him. But that's actually just one long take. That's me delivering the line, yeah. going back, going off camera, shooting the bo shooting the little glass bottle, yeah, and then basically just splicing splicing that frame in half and then right. setting them all there. And it ended up working out pretty well. Yeah. And you put them up. You said you actually mentioned just before cameras were rolling. You have a YouTube channel. Yes. Okay. So just under my name. Fantastic. So okay. Uh -oh. We like to have artisans on speak weigh in on big issues, their opinion, how they see it. I'm not looking for any right or wrong answers. Okay. Not going for that. Okay. Um, and I know you've heard it. Pretty much everybody has heard it. You know, oh, and I'm just going to call it as it is. Amazon is killing all of the bricks and mortar bookstores. Mm -hmm. And I always like to stipulate that I say bricks and mortar instead of real world bookstores because it's all real world, the internet is the real world, we all need to realize what happens on the internet impacts the real world and vice versa. I see it as kind of a natural evolution of book selling. Uh, more people are reading than ever before, so can we really say that bricks and mortar stores are being killed? But I do really like hearing different people's opinions on this. Uh, when you are ready to buy a book for yourself to read, do you shop online? Do you go to a bookstore? What? How do you weigh in on that whole Amazon versus bricks and mortar? So, order. so basically yes and no mm. is what I say there. So brick and mortar stores, yes, they should exist. There will always be people who who have to go into the bookstore, who have to search through the shelves and find what catch their eye and feel the page, turn their hands. You know, uh, my sister's one of those people. I believe she still vehemently refuses to buy a Kindle, uh, basically for this reason. Um, and I also understand that that evolution is the essence of progress, right? You know, yeah. we had to get, you know, uh, the Photonic Doctor in Star Trek Voyager had to get the, the hollow novels he made. We had to get, they had to get there somehow, right? right? But that being said, you know, it's that a monopolistic, world swallowing purgatory born corporation whose smirking logo is making George Orwell turn in his grave. You and know. did you hear that Amazon is branching into healthcare? <laughs> just to support your statement, Greg, I'm just trying to be there supportive. Is, there is there is a there's a there in in Universal Defender, one of the species has a phrase in their native language that is called Ne Jadul, which translates as no go die. Which is where you're basically like, no, go die. Or you disagree with someone so hard you hope it kills them or something. Yeah. Okay. That's, so, I think that's So basically, ne jadul mm -hmm. on that one. So down with megacorps. Yeah. And yourself, when you 
have a book that you want to read, where do you pick it up? Oh, usually I'll look online to see which store has it. Gotcha. Gotcha. Like I'll use, use the online resource to locate where, it, where to hunt it down. Yeah, I was just going to say, use the internet as a resource as opposed to as the final location. Yeah. Hmm, or the final destination, I should say. Right. Even though, isn't that a series of films where a bunch of people die? Final destination? So Logs don't bounce, I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, I think that one of the other things that I've, folks have brought up in previous episodes is that idea of, you know, you walk into a bookstore and there's nothing that beats that, a bricks and mortar store, nothing that beats that ambiance, you know, that, that feeling. And I understand, like, like your sister, uh, maybe they, it's just, it's that feeling of walking into that location filled with books. Watch, like a couple days, for, couple days after this airs, Anne's going to text me and be like, I did buy a Kindle and now I feel stupid. <laughs> like... How much you want to bet that's going to happen? And before that happens, <laughs> well, you got you're going to have to just contact me. You go, yep, got that text from Anne. Yep. Um, and I, I always stop myself from gently arguing by telling this story. I wanted to get a baby shower gift years ago for a friend, and a classic book. It's literally sold millions of copies worldwide. Is a children's book called Good Dog Carl. It's about a big Rottweiler. It has very little text, if any, that loves its little baby new sister or brother and, like, carries the baby around on its back. And it's watercolors. It's beautiful. And went to the largest Barnes & Noble, a Barnes & Noble superstore, as they were called at that point. And it wasn't there. And they said, well, yeah, I can special order it in three days for you. And I'm like, well, yeah, but I can special order it in three days from pretty much anybody. Right. Uh, and so I always gently want to argue, but a bricks and mortar store has to stock what will sell. They have massive overhead compared to an online store the, uh, in terms of margin. They have limited space as opposed to almost infinite space. Mm -hmm. And who is to say that what I want to read is on their shelves? I don't have a solution. I don't know what the perfect bookstore looks like. Um, I have gone to various online bookstores, typed in the exact, that is the squirrel, Gregor, that lives in that wall. Okay. It's here to support you. <laughs> Worry not. The, uh, the, the wisdom in that choice is questionable. <laughs> so I don't have a solution to what the perfect bookstore would look like, but I do know that I can go to an online bookstore sometimes, I can type in the exact title I'm looking for, and it gives me... 50 other choices, most of them paid and promoted and et cetera, et cetera, that is tied into some keyword in my title as opposed to just giving me all the books with that exact title, in which case the book I'm looking for would probably be in the first, you know, either the first or the first five. Have you ever thought about what would the perfect bookstore be, is it the bookstore of the future, or if you could control how people bought their books, how would it be done? Do you have any ideas, any solutions? That's that seems like the sort of question that inherently cannot have a solution. You know, you're you're asking for what is the perfect solution? Like perfection is itself a, mm -hmm. something that can only be strived for, right? So, I mean, I could answer like, what would the perfect bookstore look like for me? Sure. I can't answer what's going to look like just for in everyone. general. Yeah. I mean, what and would even it look like even for then, you? I'm not sure if it would be perfect, mm. right? You know, that's. Um, you know, that, and it's not even necessarily a bookstore, more just book collection. Oh, Right, you know, yeah. what, what I personally would have collected, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that even when it comes to searching in the, for the stores, in the stores for that book, that's part of it. And if you can't find it in the store, then, you know, fine, whatever, order it online. Mm -hmm. Whatever, you, you know, you tried. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, you sure. tried, sure, you know, and you tried. Yeah. Um, but, you know... <laughs> It's it's the word perfect that always kind of mm. kind of like gives a little like, nah, nah, nah. but yeah, I I only know what I would want my collection to look like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, and and that would be you know a wall shelf full of all of all the classics and what have you, like the sort of exemplars of each genre, mm -hmm. and you know a whole section dedicated to philosophy, to classic philosophy and what have you, and like other stuff, very organized and very and very complete with. Like I said, the exemplars of their mm -hmm. other genres, and also uh, prop and other lesser known hidden gems, 
this is what my collection would look like, not my store. Yes, right. Um, but you know, the the store. I don't know, probably because it had it would it would be perfect because it had what I wanted. Yeah, right. See, like, I mean, I, I, I agree with you. I don't think there is a solution right now. I I honestly don't. There's too much content. Right. Uh, you know, I don't care how good someone's algorithm is, which I'm not seeing great algorithms in online stores. Uh, it's we we talked in a previous episode about. If, let's say, you go to Amazon and you browse, you know how, well, first of all, you have to know how to browse at Amazon, how to actually reach the categories. We've had authors appear on the show already who they're like, I didn't even know you could do that. But beyond that, if I'm saying uh, science fiction with, I'm just going to make this very, very simple, science fiction with blue aliens, show me science fiction with blue aliens. And it shows me that. And then it says, you may also like, and it's going to show me other science fiction with aliens. So it's always uh, amplifying more of the same as opposed to saying, you know, science fiction, here's 57 other subgenres. Have you ever considered expanding though, uh, exploring those? And it makes me think back when B. Dalton's and Walden's were still bricks and mortar stores they were talking about putting kiosks into every store where you could type in any book. And if they didn't have it in stock, they would literally print and bind a copy of this kiosk in the next hour and you could come back and pick it up. And I always thought to myself, why in the world did that not fly? And then of course, I don't think it will surprise you, corporate greed. It was, well, who gets paid what percentages when the books are sold that way? That also would be very difficult to track logistically. Yes. You know, they were saying, uh, I think it was, they were going to pull from Bowker. Uh, well, at the time, it was called Bowker, the agency that controls ISBNs, mm. uh, which is the serial number on the back of a book, you guys, in right. case you don't know what that is. But, um, and I thought, well, that to me would be, again, let's avoid the word perfect. That would be a solution to walking into a store and going, oh, this is not how I would have curated this content. You know, where's the philosophy section? One shelf. The science fiction is okay, only I mean, Isaac Asimov. Uh, speaking of, philosophy, know, Asimov, speaking of philosophy section, I went yeah. to the Vashon Island Library, uh, the, the King County Library branch from Vashon yeah. Island. I literally go to their philosophy section. I'm not seeing anything. <laughs> it's like, it's it's totally mixed in with their theology stuff. Oh. Like, and I'm like, guys, like, I'm not I'm not seeing any of these actually being as philosophy volumes. Like, I'm, even, I'm like even looking at their... There are Dewey Decimal numbers. Yeah. And I'm like, these aren't philosophers who wrote these. These are theologians. Yeah, like these are theologians and, you know, religious scholars. And I'm like, guys, what gives? I think I know enough about Vashon's community in general. Is it a, a heavily religious Hell community? Hell I know. I mean, I know that Frank Peretti, well, he, he did, le- uh, he's a, a, a very well-known Christian science fiction writer. Uh, he made his home on Vashon for many, 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 many years. I don't know if he's still there. I wonder. Yeah, who knows? Okay, well, there you go. No, uh, the, uh, theology and philosophy should not be shelved no, I was, um, in the same way. Gentlemen. Yeah. Gentlemen, please. 600,000. <clears throat> so a little bit over half a million books are either self-published, independent published, corporate published, uh, every single year in America alone. To me, therein lies a, a huge part of why that word perfect, whether or not it can ever be achieved in anything, but the a solution, I don't know if there is a solution to a bookseller that can do better than Amazon or better than um, a local store. Because that is a lot of content every year. In those, with, with faced with that kind of content, that level of content, what do you feel makes Universal Defender, the series, stand out? What makes it unique? Is it unique? Well, it's not one of the probably half of those 600,000 that are chasing trend of the hour. Mm. You know, Universal Defender, this is a series that has been cooking in my head since I was seven years old when I first thought of the name of Radian itself. Mm-hmm. Granted, it was initially called Radian X. Mm-hmm. There's an X on it. I, don't remember for sure how I got it, but it was kind of one day I just kind of woke up and I'm like, now there's a name, Radian X Doomfire Chaos Maker. Mm. Right? And that's what it became, and that's what it was. And, and uh, over years and years and years, uh, there was actually a slew of titles that got tacked on. 
um, depending on, you know, what, just what I was doing at the time, what games I was playing, you know, um, these were titles that were sort of like accolades to my achievements in games or to the, or to the battles that I was having um, in my sort of headspace, you know. Yeah. I've always been that one kid at recess who was just kind of in his own little world at some isolated corner of the field waving a stick around. Yeah. And you had no idea what this dude was doing. But I was basically making those stories, the stories that you're seeing in there. Yeah. And, you know, this, this is something that has been for, for so long a part of my life that now is finally here. Like, um... When, when I first saw the cover for Today I Saved Myself, mm -hmm. um, and that symbol, because that symbol has also been around for a long time, too. Um, I don't actually remember the sound I made for sure, but it was definitely a noise. Mm -hmm. when, when finally there was a physical representation yeah. of this universe that I've been cooking for so long, whether I had been, whether I'd been creating it, you know, on, you know, the, like in that little dirt pit. At, on Green Gables Elementary soccer field or in the woods near my ho house, um, that old house in Auburn, mm -hmm. or in the backyard of that house waving around stick and what yeah. have you. And actually, it was usually a wooden dowel bought from Home Depot. That was a staff. See, originally, Radian was wielding a staff. Okay. Um, and Radian is the main character in Universal Defender. Right, yes. Okay, yeah. Miles Sorvino Radian is his name. Okay. Um, no uh, X anymore. No X and no slew of titles that actually made him sound a little more like a villain than a than a, than a, than a hero, mm -hmm. um, which actually was, an, was sort of like an official event that happened when I was early in high school that was the name devillainization protocol, which was to change it to Miles Sorvignon Radian mm -hmm. instead of Radian X Doomfire Chaos Maker. Yeah. Um, and er, yeah, originally he wielded a staff because, no, you know, I didn't have any swords back then. Sure. But and it was a dowel from Home Depot usually um, that was getting spun around and what have you. And yeah. So, what what's making Universal Defender unique? Well, it's it is a uni it is it is a fully developed universe it's that hasn't really been churned, that is that has been realized over all this time. It hasn't been churned out by a number cruncher, mm -hmm. or isn't a by the by, isn't itself by the numbers. Nor is it chasing the newest trend that only exists because someone did it once and made a bunch of money off of it. Mm -hmm. And one, and also that these characters are putting forth all of their skill, mm -hmm. all of their intelligence to achieve what goals they have. And granted, you kind of can tell a little bit that that it really has been cooking for a while because the most common thing I hear um, is that there's a bit of a lack of juxtaposition between action segments. Like it seems to be going in an absolute whirlwind, especially in the first book. I mean, that's because, you know, I've heard this story 10 billion times before already. Yeah. And it's still really hard for me to figure out no one else has. Mm -hmm. But then again, you know, Radiant's also feeling the whirlwind, too. He just got sucked into this bigger universe that he's suddenly a part of, that he's glad to be a part of, but he's still very much figuring it out, all out. Mm -hmm. But... I was going to say when... I was going to say instead of timely, you know, those trendy books that you're talking right. about, which I agree, I think a large percentage of the books published every year are hopping on some kind of bandwagon are right. like you which, say chasing which some itself trend. causes in my in my which itself causes the stuff that should be paid attention to to totally get buried in that landslide like 100 percent. i you know i am totally writing for a bit of a niche audience it's very much a a lot especially with a lot of these species these mm -hmm. non-human species that are in universal defender a lot of them are sort of if you know you know mm. right and and if you know, you know. Um, and there, and this this is a particular crowd that really doesn't have a whole lot of writers. You know, there's a few. Mm -hmm. um, I think they're like I know a couple of my friends know of like one or two writers within that sphere, but they don't. They didn't even write sci-fi. They were contemporary, and uh, hmm. it was like contemporary introspection stuff. Okay. But even for that community, it felt a, it felt a little tropey even at the time with the particular themes they were going into. But yeah. Um. Yeah, these guys really do sleep on writers, this particular community, and if you know, you know. Mm -hmm. They totally do sleep on people who are not creating, you know, traditional visual art. Yeah. Or, and you know, and they know of, like, two musicians at most. And one of them's a huge prick. Um, I wish I was joking, but for some yeah. reason he's the most popular fucking musician in, the enti in this entire subculture. And mm -hmm. um, hardly anybody else knows anyone else who does this sort of stuff most but and it's 
I know that it's frustrating. I've been with other writers and other yeah and other musicians within this community who are like, why do people? Why are people demand like saying why can't we have good content? Like here it is. You guys just are still scurrying back to these guys, right? And you know, can, can you name three musicians within this within this subculture? No, you can name two. That is too bad because it's and it reminds me a lot of when you know when they say different subgenres of science fiction are controlled by just one or two you know controlled by just one or two authors and often I'm like but and you know my my comments is about science fiction in general thing. yeah no 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 yeah um, that's interesting and I was going to say instead of chasing trends the books are. Uh, I've always loved the phrase, instead of timely, they're timeless. But that doesn't really fit with Universal Defender. I want to say it would almost be more accurate to say they're outside of time. Because it's not like you're saying, in the year 2075, the world looks like this. No. Well, it it does start, like, sort of contemporary. But um, (laughs) um, the upcoming novella Mm -hmm. um, is, like, 200 years after Today I Saved Myself. Yeah. uh, Because the character totally does achieve... Mm -hmm. um, biological agelessness but that's sort of a it's sort of a given in universal defender it is not difficult to not die of age are you pl- because she technology and yeah. psionics both um See, just kind of that point. dangerous universe i would be surprised if someone would live to ever die of yeah and that's age, like if it was possible and like that that's the thing like it's sort of in Universal Defender, it's understood that the universe is a big place, mm-hmm. right? There's room for the immortal, mm-hmm. but it's also really hard to actually keep that up because, like, sure, you can be immortal, just good luck actually getting past a thousand. Yeah. Like, I, I think, like, in the in universe statistic is that, you know, the amount of people of a given species that ever actually live past the natural biological lifespan is like less than 1% or something. Oh. Okay. But it's just the case that Radiant just happens to hang out with a crowd of people who are like him, mm-hmm. who. Who totally would be the adventurers that that uh, live for that long? Radian, I mean, do you see him as the eternal champion trope? No, he's not supposed to be. Like that's um, this let's see that that is a question that's really hard for me to get into without spoiling future events. Oh, okay, like, all right, but but no, I think it's it's fair to just say. No, I mean, no he's that's, not. that's not the archetype that you're creating that on. That's not the archetype. That's not your framework. Right, yeah. Oh, I'm trying to think and of what In fact, like, yeah. the plot of Enter Unmaker concerns a purported Destiny's Child. Hmm, okay. Right. And I, I feel like I can say that just because it's about to get released and all that. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. But, you know, that, that question of Radian being that, really hard to answer without spoiling things. Okay, all right. I just, you know, I think it's, uh, you know, when you throw out the word universal. Right. You know, I don't want people to leap to, oh, that's, you know, that's just a, another eternal champion. Right. You know, so, now, the other works, in addition to the ones that are forthcoming. So, you wrote a short story for Super, which was an anthology where uh, authors created characters or stories where the protagonist lives with a chronic medical condition or disability, and how did that actually become a strength for that person? Right. This idea of anyone can be heroes... And let's talk about that a little bit, and then we'll go on to Reticent. Right. So... It's funny because... Where did you get your idea for your super story? Why okay, did so well, you? yeah. So, Carmen Protocol is the name of the story that I wrote in there. Yeah. Main char- the protagonist um, has schizoid personality disorder, mm-hmm. which is not to be confused with schizophrenia. I'll, I will punch you in the face if you do so. <laughs> right, you know, that Very sort clear. of thing. Um, which is typically characterized by just general emotional detachment, sometimes coldness, very high rationality and logic, uh, you know, almost that Vulcan demeanor, and also sometimes a very in-depth and detailed fantasy world. It is uh, that that char- the character in that shares that diagnosis with myself. Mm-hmm. Right? That is that is some, that is what I live with, mm-hmm. and to me, I do personally see it as a strength because mm-hmm. it allows me to not get wrapped up in emotion and. You know, allows me to do what must be done, mm-hmm. which in his case, he does what must be done, mm-hmm. right? Because he's he's able to un- he's able to acknowledge there's a time for that. It is not now. And yeah. He's very able to put a solid wall, like no, I got a job to do. Right. Right. Yes. And that's that's why I I personally just believe it is a strength for me. Mm-hmm. Right. So mm-hmm. 
in fact, the opening line is even is even where he says, I think they call it skews like personality disorder because they're jealous that I'm not so vulnerable to emotion. I, uh, I, I often take offense or at least argue with that particular word disorder is I'm like, well, you know, I don't particularly always want order in my life. So one of the, uh, you can take one of the species in universal defender has a, has a word that basically translates as heart brain, which is an insult. Mm-hmm. Which means somebody who makes their decisions based on emotion more often than logic. Yeah, I like that. And it's not a compliment. Heartbrain, one word? Well, it, the oh, word, I'm sorry. the it's word a... itself is Yaloth. Okay, thank you. All right, huh. Which translates as heartbrain. I like that. Yeah, okay. All right, so I liked a lot of the stories in Super. I particularly found yours very authentic. It rang very true, and that explains them, I think, a little bit yeah. more. Not that all authors can write about something they live with but i feel that you can so i I applaud you yeah and you did i applaud you on that one now with reticent now we're going to kind of straddle that line between film and books there was a feature film that you were cast in to play a character whose actual well his actual name is not matthew or reticent actually but then he, but, what, it, what it says there is yeah. it's not pronounceable but then <laughs> okay. i did actually have a few ideas for it okay so you were going to play the character, and then the pandemic happened, mm-hmm. and the film turned into an animated film, turned into a, wow, animated films take a really long time to make. Let's put out these kind of novelizations of the film. You wrote the novelization of the film, which is also forthcoming, but you also wrote kind of the, would you call it the backstory, the origin story of your character, not from the script, completely from your own brain. Right. What would you call it? Origin story, backstory? Not origins. Not origin story. Yeah. But almost backstory. Sort of like, okay. you know, whoa, whoa. backstory to the film itself. Mm-hmm. Right? This character has, bas- the reticent character basically has two backstories mm-hmm. in universe. Mm-hmm. Right? He has the backstory of what he was doing on Earth and what he was doing before then. Yeah. Um, yeah. This is the Earth half of that backstory. Okay. And there how we go. He, and how he becomes the entity that is seen in the film. Thank you. It, Gregor, you have an excellent way of explaining things that doesn't that don't that doesn't give too much away. Because I was just like, oh, I really don't want people to know. But yes, okay, so this is Reticent's Earth backstory. Right. Alright, that makes sense to me. And that is, like I was saying to you guys, that's a blue flash, so that's one of the little pocket sizes. But back to Universal Defender. So I had uh, and I'm, I'm hoping that I am not going to offend you when I say this, but if I do, just say, Jennifer, that's offensive. And I'm, I'm cool with that. I will revise my question. There has been a lot of social discussion over the last five years about the how bootstrap method is not really a appropriate method. The idea of bootstrap method is if we all just work hard enough, no matter what, we can achieve all of our dreams. You know, just us against the world, each of us, we have every opportunity that everyone else has if we just pull ourselves up by the bootstraps and keep going and work hard. And of the course- We say that, well, I mean, the people who are unironically say that, we have a word for that, it's called survivorship bias. You know? And, I, and yeah, because I mean, I think, most hopefully more and more of us every day i don't actually think most of us believe this but hopefully more and more every day see okay wait a minute socioeconomic status race uh disability all of these things make that just pull yourself that you could reach the american dream impossible so it but he does stand alone it is the oldest truth it is my oldest truth this is the oldest you know the oldest truth, the fact, oldest truth, the fact that has been known since fact could be known, is yeah. that I stand alone. But this is not a bad thing, right. because the strength and solitude is that no one can betray you when you're all that's there. I am steel and I am doom. I am skill and I am stone. And though it is this is the oldest truth that I stand alone, this is not a bad thing. Right? This is absolutely. If there was ever a motto that has lasted or a mantra that has lasted with me longer than any other, it's that one. You know, it's mm-hmm. lasted up like that is a truth I have personally known, you know, for as long as the name of Radiant's been with me. Mm-hmm. Right? It is the oldest truth. Let's take that as the given, right? Radiant stands alone. But is that then bootstrap method? No. That's Talk to me about spite that. Spike method. Mm. He he he's not necess- like now. It is the case that um, we, we, today I save myself basically starts when Radiant's leaving Earth, right? It would start you know very quickly. Radiant's off world by yeah. the time you know Universal Defender like 
what like I think he's like left the planet by the fifth page or something. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the one, two, three. Uh, oh yeah, page twelve. He's all, he's already off the planet, mm-hmm. right? And it's also kind of the case that um, the well, the the topic of Radian's past on Earth is one that he personally doesn't really like to delve into. It's one of those things, like, it's such... It was such a dumb time. It was such a dull, gray, and bu- and bullshit era of, my, of his life that, mm-hmm. you know, he, he's like, it doesn't even deserve the honor of a grave, of mm-hmm. being pitied or cursed, <laughs> right? He's like, it's just... No, it's, that's not where I am anymore. That's, where, that's what he says about it. Like, he really doesn't like delving into that, his time on Earth, because it was just... It's not worth mentioning. Right? Yeah. It was just, it was just, it was, it was that bad that it was just, you know, why bother giving it the satisfaction of continuing to affect it? Mm-hmm. He's um, not going to dwell there. Right. Both literally and emotionally. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he, I mean, he does permanently leave Earth eventually. Yeah. Um, it just ties up a few cents first. Mm-hmm. But, no, yeah, um, and he wasn't even necessarily pulling himself up by his bootstraps. You know, he was continuing to exist out of spite. I mean, he was like, you know, if I if I keel over and die, that means they win, and at the very least, I'll deny them that. Um, but he he wasn't even really doing that. He'd, in fact, it is the it is the sudden circumstance of the arrival of the, what allows him to leave Earth that even lets that happen. Yeah, and Radiant even does internally quite a lot struggle with the sort of like with the survivorship bias. He knows that he's now subject possibly vulnerable to. He's like, you know, I know that circumstance allowed me to become what I am now, and there's there is a lot of conflict in him about that. He's and and he does in in his internal headspace, he definitely does struggle with, you know, I made it out, but I can't, but I I but I can't ignore how many just did it. Yes. So he does have. I wouldn't say he. I wouldn't say he has survivor's guilt about it because he really doesn't, and he doesn't even think he does. He's just like. I know, like, he's just very mindful of why he didn't, why he wasn't essentially crushed under the gray boot on Earth. Yeah. He's very mindful about that, and he, and he even, like, uses that to keep himself from sh- straying off the, the path of who he wants to be. Mm-hmm. So now he's not pulling himself up by his bootstraps. He's suddenly finding himself with the, with the tools to, to stand alone and also find fulfillment in life. Gotcha. Okay, I I was hoping, I was kind of hoping that you would be able to articulate yeah. that part of his journey because I think it is, it, it, we need to, I, and I also like what you're saying, he is mindful of, even if this isn't, you know, you're actively exploring survivor guilt, he is mindful of those who did not escape yeah. the emotional, societal, gravitational pull of earth and the oppressors there uh now before you read for us today i'm just trying to get to the part i wanted you i have to ask this this is completely off script but i have to ask you to tell us about your pen so i asked you to autograph the author copies uh the office copies i should say i'm sorry the office copies that i brought over and you had mentioned that you actually made your pen right um, yeah, um, yeah, so this, this one's actually a little, there's a little, it's a little broken because the clip part's gone here and this yeah. needs to be pressed back in, but dad has the pen press. <laughs> um, but yeah, I did make this one. Um, uh, th- this was actually not made using our typical methods of making pens because usually we're making them out of wood and, uh, acrylic and sometimes this funky material called true stone. Okay. Um, which, um, uh, allows me to, which would, which allows you to sort of facsimile a pen of what that what looks like lapis with gold veins running through it without actually having to get your hands on lapis or actual malachite. It's called true stone. Hmm. Um, it's a it's pretty interesting stuff to work with. Yeah. Um, but this was actually uh, this was actually clay. We, what I had done was I sort of did this. What what I had done was I had combined the colors in a sort of uh, in the hard candy sort of method where I'm which are like rolling them together and stretching yes. them out and then taking a little. Um, straight razor and going thunk, 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 and then um, wrapping that around the brass tubes that house the actual parts and what have you. Mm-hmm. And then I and then fire that, bake it, and then just sand it, polish it, uh, assemble it. See, th- this is a very easy pen to assemble. Mm-hmm. 
there's only one part that actually requires a whole lot of, there, there's only like one sort of oh no part, which is putting this this bit in here where the actual ink cartridge goes in. Because if yeah. you push it to, if you, this one's actually a little short, um, it's not in enough. Mm -hmm. So it's actually supposed to go up to like about here, you're supposed to press it in that much. Uh -huh. But if you press it in too short, then it doesn't come out when you twist it. Right. When you press it in too far, then it, you don't press it in, yeah, when you press it too far forward, then you actually, uh, then, then it won't even retract properly. And in fact, the first pen that uh, me and my dad ever made, we did we did mess that one up. The first pen we had ever made. And it wouldn't. In that yeah. exact spot, too. With that exact piece. Yeah. That exact housing for the cartridge. Well, and that's where I we always... messed up. We pushed it, and we pushed it too far. And we tried to, like, grab, like, a pair of pliers and yank it out, but it, no, it yeah. was in there. It was in it fit perfectly. Authors should have a pen, but I think this takes it to a whole new level. Right. If we say not only should authors have a pen that they always do their autographing yeah, I mean, with, Dad's, but Dad's got all the it. tools. He took those with him to Minnesota. I mean, he kind of needed them more than I did anyway, but um, yeah, he's got all the tools now. He's got the lathe and the... No, he didn't take the drill press. That thing was too big. Uh, nor did he take the table saw. I'm sure you honestly don't think of yourself I'm as sure eclectic even as you're... He didn't take the band saw either, but I think he's planning on getting a saw stop. So... I don't want to say carpentry. That that seems a little misleading. No, uh, we, did, we did that. We okay. Did that. All right. So we also made we also made boxes and such. Okay. Um, there's a box uh, in the cathedral um, that is one that he made. Yeah. But that's the sort. But they're the sort of boxes that we did make. Gotcha. Okay. That all right. So made. you are going to read for us today, and this is basically a segment where we ask artisans to read a single page, and we're basically trying to emulate like when someone walks through a bookstore and they pick up a book and just like, okay, what is this? Or even, admittedly, online, usually the, um, like at Amazon, it's called right. Look Inside yeah. the Book or something like that. Which book are you going to read from? Well, I'm going to be reading from Fire to Burn the Stars. Okay. Because that is the one where I start actually putting in some soliloquies. Okay. Uh, today I Save Myself doesn't have a whole lot of quotable moments. There is one or two, but this is the one that has the more. Okay. You know, I do want to bring back soliloquies. I do totally want to do that. And Radian does have a soliloquy. That even has to do with that little bit of mindful of what, allow, what is allowed him to leave his planet. Yeah. That we were talking about earlier. Okay. And I'm just I'm just going to read the soliloquy itself, not the not like the in between part where it says uh, he continued and you know that. No, it's fine. That the his uh, that's five now seemed confused as to why those were the people Miles was thinking about. Absolutely. Just the raw words themselves of what of Miles's monologue. Okay. After having completed his mission on the planet of Kilintarn. Mir McCartney wanted it all, even in death. He wanted to be taken prisoner and paraded through the streets in the golden cage as jubilant throngs celebrated the capture of the... whatever his bullshit title was. He wanted his crimes read to him, etched on a marble tablet lined with jewels inscribed with an iridium chisel. He wanted ten speeches, all about how detestable he was before the gilded executioner's axe cleanly carved off his head into an ebony bucket. And with his head and the bucket enshrined in separate diamond glass display cases in the Museum of the Dictator. And so I denied him that. I denied him the glorious death and immortality he thought he deserved, and gave him the one he really did. But true as that is, I still understand why some will undoubtedly be upset. I wonder how many people who wanted nothing more than to fight never actually ended up doing that by way of circumstance. Fighters, warriors, who may very well have left their homes and gone to the cities, hoping to find a few regime pigs to finally use their martial prowess on, but for some reason there just happened to be no patrols and no activity wherever they were that day. How many fighters didn't just not get to fight? How many managed somehow to never have the chance? How many were involuntarily pacifist? A planet connected, where you can hear the screams from a continent away, where the fire was everywhere except where you could actually help put it out. Not even smoke, not even the sound, not even the smell of gunpowder or the sound of shots in the distance. Both there to see it all and so far away that you can't do a damn thing. How many times did the warriors only get to watch what they knew they could have done so much better? How many of them went mad? How many died by their own hands so thoroughly denied not just peaceful existence but the chance to fight for it? How many stories were stolen by way of never being permitted the opportunity to be made? How many ballads lost their heroes because the heroes never got their chance? Do me a favor and find those people, Svivna. Find them, and make sure they have a chance to know victory before the end. 
I'm not even sure if I have any right to no longer be among them. That does. That is a perfect segue. Yeah. What is, what what is, is this thing? thing? This, ah, thank you for asking. This is also a reoccurring theme here on Speak, Gregor. This is not a set piece for the show. But in this day of supply chain issues, the two portfolio style bamboo shelves that are supposed to be here to display all of the beautiful books are now, after two days shipping, on week three. Oh, so, it's like a shower again. Yes, exactly. <laughs> well, Gregor, thank you for appearing on Speak today and for talking with us. The one thing that I am going to throw out is, at least right now, you'll see Greg Laurel on a lot of Gregor's work. Uh, that is because he recently went through a legal name change. All of these books will be released, re-released with his correct name. But for right now, if you are looking for Gregor's work, look for Greg Laurel at blueforgepress.com or anywhere where independent books are sold. There's also going to be a few continuity edits to today, I say for myself. One of the characters' heights has incorrectly spoken in that one. How much, how, how far is so, it So, uh, it initially says that Viralis is an entire foot taller than Radian. No, she's okay. eight inches taller. Okay, so... so Viralis is six foot two, Radian's, you know, five foot six. So if you guys want the first edition, it will need to say... Greg Laurel on it, but know that the height. But know that Viralis is six foot two, not an entire six foot six. There you go. Now, if someone sends you their first edition in the mail to your publisher, will you autograph it? I'm sure. Why not? <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, why not? I'm, I'm not busy these days. Yeah, sure. All right. Thank you, Gregor, right, for coming on. on. Thank you. Since I started in the creative industry in 1989, I have worked with more than 8,000 authors, musicians, actors, filmmakers, game designers, artisans. I have raised more than half a million dollars to print, produce, and promote their work to educate, elevate, and empower. Some of these artisans have been grateful. Others have been little benign dictators, but despite how diverse they are, perhaps because of how diverse they are, I have cared about each of these storytellers in their own right. But whether artisans have been active partners or dismissive participants, they all shared one thing, and, and that's a great passion for their own work. But of them all, Gregor embodies a kind of clarity of vision and sheer dedication to Universal Defender and all that that universe is that I think every other artisan I've worked with, they pale in comparison. I, I hope that all of us at some point in our lives have that clarity and dedication like Gregor has for Universal Defender because I think there is indescribable joy to be found in that kind of connection and to embody your work in that way. Thank you for joining us today for Speak. Speak is brought to you by the 501c3 nonprofit Blue Legacy, and it's made possible in part by grants from the National Endowment for the Arts and the Washington Arts Commission. If you'd like to be interviewed on Speak or you have a question that you'd like us to ask some of our future guests, please write to us at blueforgefilms at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. Though I've done interviews before, it was a surreally positive experience to do so with Jennifer because uh, she's basically the first person in my life to have treated me like a professional, let alone an adult. So, um, an odd but welcome one for its positive nature.